This is something we've done quite a bit on our wildlife management areas. We don't have a lot of staff to um, mechanically create these feathered edges. And, uh, and we have places like this. This used to be an old, uh, it used to be a field border, you know, it was just a fallow area. And it got away from our staff. They couldn't, they didn't get in there to disc it, burn it, mow it, whatever. And it grew up in sweet gums, you know. This is probably pretty decent woodcock cover, but it's getting out of quail stage. So we went in there and, and uh, sprayed it uh, via helicopter, okay? But you can do the same thing with a, a truck and a sprayer, or just hack and squirt. You can go along and, you know, put notch in the bark and squirt chemical in there, just basically kill the trees. And this is the same little patch of, of field edge, you know, one year later. And you get this lush, you know, growth of, of good plants that come in there. We had a covey of quail using this area, and we also had a turkey nest right in this little patch. It's only half an acre. We had a turkey nest there two years in a row after we sprayed that area. So it's a, it's a pretty cost-effective way to do it. We can do it for $100 an acre. You know, good luck getting a, a dozer to do, you know, uh, that much for $100. So. Forest management is a great, a great way to uh, create quail habitat. They do this a lot in the south. Around here, we have some differences in our forests that, uh, you know, it's not quite as popular, but here we took a, a loblolly plantation, thinned it out to about 40 basal area, which is, you know, it's thinner than what a commercial forester typically would do. And this was the first year, this was just last year, and <clears throat> we had a lot of really good plants coming in there, um, a lot of uh, ragweed, and there's a a whole host of different uh, native legumes, you know, um, and people plant lespedezas and, and things for quail. There's a lot of just native uh, plants that are very similar. Our state botanist went out to this place. He was just ecstatic. He, was, he wrote down this list. He spent hours out there looking at all these plants, and he said, man, we don't find these you know, anywhere else in the state. You go in there, you cut these trees, and now look, look at what we have, you know. He was really excited. All these rare plants that just don't grow anywhere else um, popped up into this, this uh, basically uh, timber harvest area. I put food plots pretty low on the list here and mentioned all the other things first because usually that's not the limiting factor on a property. <clears throat> Especially around here, we've got, uh, we've got a lot of uh, Foods, you know, natural foods that birds can eat. I think I've got a list in here. Um, but, you know, they can be used successfully in places where you want to, you know, really give the birds some good, good quality food right next to the cover. Uh, yeah, here's a, um, this is from a research project, important quail foods. And uh, you can see everything with the, uh, uh, the asterisk there is, is uh, a native plant, you know, that it's in that soil just ready to be released. You, know? you can get there by disking or burning or just letting the field go fallow, and you get all that those plants there. And uh, maintenance of habitat is real important. These things are temporary, and you need to go back in and do something to keep them in that early successional stage. Disking and burning are the really the preferred methods. Uh, mowing tends to uh, create a thatch. You know, you're basically just knocking off the um, material, putting it on the ground, and you're not, you're not creating that bare ground situation that they need. And, uh, and a lot of times when you mow something like, you know, a field where you might have some sweet gums coming in, you mow that and it just comes back even thicker. You know, so you're just exacerbating the problem. Um, whereas if you can get in there and burn it at the right time, do a prescribed burn, um, you can really knock them back and, and uh, minimize your issues with stuff like that. And I th believe some other folks are going to talk about cost share programs for habitat, CRP, CREP, um, WIP, Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program, all can be used to do this. You can get paid to do what you want to do regarding quail and, and, uh, and wildlife management, you know. And it's, it's actually fairly lucrative. I mean, you can get some really good payments for for doing this. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there about that and uh, you can get in touch with your local uh, soil conservation district staff and they can uh, uh, tell you more details. So just a quick summary. Uh, quail declined 
primarily due to habitat loss. Quail need early successional habitat, and um, and really, it's that's the only way to restore populations on a large scale. Uh, you can you can minimize the impact of predators with good habitat management. Something I didn't mention is that, um, and I don't know, I'm going to get the, into this a little bit when I talked about the, uh, the research study, but places where you have real open, mature hardwoods, um, with a lot of basically hawk perches, you know, quail really tend to be hammered on hard, you know, so if you've got a hedgerow or a little woodlot, you remove those places where hawks can, you know, perch and hunt, and you remove a lot of that mortality. You know, that's you can manage the habitat to manage the predators without necessarily going out there and, you know, shooting the hawk. You know, he, you can make it diff, his life difficult without um, uh, getting rid of of the actual animal. Um, habitat management should focus on providing a diversity of habitat types. You know, it's all about diversity. You want, you want, you don't want it to say you don't you don't want to go out to your farm and be able to say, well, you know, here's my nesting area and my warm season grass. Here's my food plot. It's much better to just have it all mixed up. You know, just very random. You know, just meandering trails. Nothing, nothing in a straight line. That you know, a hawk can sit on the edge of a field, and look straight down there, 300 yards. And, you know, a lot of people have nice mowed trails on the edge of their field. It's just a trap, you know, the bird goes from the, from the brushy edge out to the crop, crop field, they can see them, but you make that trail, you know, curve where, you know, you can only see 20 yards, and it's going to be a lot more difficult. So, think of those things. And there are a lot of programs out there. I'm going to go, um, I got a little bit of time. No? Well, okay. I'll um, real quickly just go through some of the results in my uh, of uh, DNR's radio telemetry study. I'll just crank through this. We did a, a research project where we uh, <coughs> worked primarily at Chino Farms, and we um, well, this is a it's a 5,000 acre property. Most of the quail habitat is up in this area, up in here, and uh, also down here. That's where we had most of our birds. We, uh, it's been managed for, for quail and, and other grassland birds and, and wildlife in general for um, probably uh, 15, 20 years. We had uh, 36 coveys that we found last year in our sampled area. It's a fairly high density area. <coughs> we did scent station surveys to document predator population, mammalian predator population. It's interesting. This was a uh, um, a uh, method that was developed by Tall Timbers Research Station. They f they basically said if you have over 20 percent of your scent stations that you set out on the property, over 20 percent are visited by mammalian predators. That you probably your quail population is probably uh, greatly you know, limited by predation. And we had 78% of our scent stations visited by mammalian predators. So there was a ton of foxes, possums, uh, um, cats. You know, you can see the breakdown there. Uh, but yet they had great quail numbers. You know, they had a lot of quail for a lot of years. Um, probably the, one of the best places in the state. So that kind of shows you they were doing no predator control, but yet, yet they had a lot of quail. Um, so they, you can't have both. We trapped quail and uh, put radio translators on them, followed them around. We had 75 total. This is what happened to them. This is really ugly. Three-month period, we lost 74 of the 75 quail. Okay, and um, it was it was kind of sad because this place was was great. You know, everything was. We were basically studying it to find out why they had so many quail. You know, what was important about that property, you know, was it nest, nesting cover, you know, what did they have that other farms did not have. Um, really, it, it comes, and we had one quail that survived by himself up until June. We lost him, lost uh, contact with him in June, I guess he went out to try to find a hen somewhere, and uh, 
because there wasn't any in that in that area. But somehow he lived by himself for months. Um, they went from having probably probably close to 40 cubbies down to about three cubbies this this last year. So is this um, what did it Yeah, I was going to mention that. You know, um, this is usually what you find is just a pile of feathers or, or, or transmitter. So you have a lot of just unknown predation. You know they were killed by something. You can't tell what it was. Only 4% of them died from exposure. Okay, that was um, three birds got trapped in a snow drift. They were hunkered under some uh, grass and the snow drifted over them and they starved to death under there. Um, that actually hasn't been documented much at all in, in uh, uh, the quail research world. Um, but it was a, just a tremendously bad winter, you know, winter of the of the century. But all the predation, you know, a, a lot of it happened around these snowfall events where you had prolonged snow cover. And, you know, when I'm talking about managing habitat, um, and we're, we're mainly talking about stuff thigh high and down, you know, you want, you know, briars and you want weeds and, and whatever. And that works, you know, 99 out of 100 years, that's fine for them. Um, but this was the one year where all of that was just gone. You know, overnight, you just have three foot of snow dumped. There's nowhere for these birds to go. They actually, um, on that property, they've done a lot of work where they tried to sort of get rid of briars and some of these things, you know, trying to make it, um, you know, a little, a little more appealing as far as, you know, walking around and, and hunting and things like that. Um, probably went sort of too, too far in that direction, got rid of a lot of their winter cover and uh, sort of paid the price here uh, last winter. Uh, we did do some habitat use work. Something that was really notable was these Cooper's hawks. They had uh, there was multiple days where you'd go out to monitor these cubbies of quail, and you just see a hawk there in the process of basically hunting and killing quail. And then the next day, you'd go out and you'd find three or four dead quail. Um, they would just hang out over top of these um, areas where these where the birds were using. Um, primarily these hardwood woodlots where they were really exposed but it was it was the, the best they had available but they would they would uh, go in there and try to do the best to, to survive but these hawks were re relentless on them and uh, just a quick summary that uh, it was uh, fall winter survival was very low and some of the management implications were you know, winter, winter cover is really critical. It, it highlighted that, and uh, you need to have your cover near food. We found birds, you know, walking across the snow pretty long distances to get to some food sources, and uh, they were really getting hammered. Let me go over the actual items. Yeah, so uh, yes. Yes. John Schultz here. Yeah, John, the... Um, the Safari Club did, did donate the transmitter for that, and I, I actually was going to mention that early on, and then Max started rushing me, and it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always Max's fault. Yeah. 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 Okay, I had some action items, and uh, yeah, we'll, in yeah, we'll, we'll just swing. Take inventory of your property, determine the goals, uh, have realistic expectations. You know, this could be a good day hunting uh, with one bird. You don't have to, to wipe them all out. Um, and uh, address the limiting factor and talk to a professional. We're, we're here to help and give us a call. Uh, Thanks. That's all I had. <laughs>